Pants my my ass. I'm on my floor. Bonjour, Monsieur Pussycat. Cracking toast, poet. To start uh, spreading the uh, news. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the short podcast about short films. I am your host, and we are discussing the Academy Award for Best Animated Short. Today's episode is about the 84th year of the award at the 88th Academy Awards, which celebrates the films of 2015. Today's guest is appearing for the eighth time. You last heard him a little over a month ago discussing the lost thing and the nominees of 2010. Please welcome back Gordon McNulty. Hello, Gordon. Hello, time has passed so much. A whole month has passed. It's not definitely not even 10 minutes. It, yeah, it's not like we just recorded that last episode just minutes ago. It's just like it's definitely a whole other month later. Or, We're, but, at, at this point, the Oscars have happened, right? This year's Oscars? Oh, uh, maybe? I'm not even sure. When, when do the Oscars happen this year? I think it's the 10th. Oh, yeah. Th- this episode's coming out March 28th. So, yeah. Wasn't it crazy when that happened? Wasn't it crazy when Oppenheimer won nine Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, Best uh, Best Adapted Screenplay, and several tech awards? Wasn't it crazy when uh, somebody just straight up shot somebody else with a gun? <laughs> I don't know who, but somebody. Yeah, they, they got him. They, yeah, they... they... They they got him. I liked him too, but yeah, yeah things happen. Well, I I don't know if I would say I liked him. He did some pretty problematic things. No, I, I meant the shooter. I liked the shooter. Ah, yeah. I loved him in that movie. Yeah, that that one movie. Wouldn't it be wild if this came true? <laughs> God, that would be that would be crazy. <laughs> the wildest called shot of all time. Eat your heart out, Babe Ruth. Let's L- talk about the animation. literal called shot. Yeah. Hey. Uh, anyway um remind us gordon what is your familiarity with the best animated short category uh i've i watched a bunch of them when i was a kid uh and so that was like a gateway of like hey these shorts that i watched when i was a kid people like them i feel validated in my opinions which is what i go to the oscars for to be validated in the opinions that i hold and every time they disagree with me well uh they're they're wrong and they're it's just the Oscars. They don't really matter. But when they say that something I like is good, uh, they're right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And with the last thing, they were wrong. Hate yeah. them. Absolutely yeah. invalid. They, 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 they were incorrect. And and speaking of years where uh, the winner is a bit controversial, uh, this is one of them. <laughs> like yeah, even like like this year is one of the most famous in terms of the best animated short category mainly because they're one of the films which we all know which one but we'll just save that for later uh is a very famous short film and it did not win (laughs) and so people are like well that sucks but yeah but it's also people don't watch bear story at all it's just like they don't they don't go out and seek out bear story be like huh i wonder why this one and to be like oh maybe this one's also a good movie and is it we'll find out but <laughs> it's like i people just think it's a bit hip- hypocritical for people that's fair mm-hmm. and, and that happens a lot it's like when people are like like uh oh raging bull should have won best picture but then they don't watch ordinary people it's just like i will say up until this morning i was one of those people being like well that other short got robbed having not seen bear story and uh i felt confident in saying that then i feel confident in saying it now uh having seen it so uh but we'll get know, there we'll, we'll, i was we'll, we'll get there moral of the story is i was correct <laughs> uh anyway but before we even get into them uh this is a very short film centric podcast but there is also a best animated feature category at the academy awards so to be to be fair to them gordon i'm going to list off the names of the nominees for best animated feature this year and i want you to tell me in just one word what you think of them or simply say you haven't seen it are you ready sure just one word i i 
I struggle with these. Yeah, but like last time see. you did exclusively two word answers. And it was just the names of people that are in them. Maybe I don't actually know in hindsight if Ian McShane is in How to Train Your Dragon. I think he is. It's but possible. Anyway. Um, number one, we have the winner, which is Inside Out. Pretty good. Two words again. Okay. Sorry. Uh, number two, we have Anomalisa. Interesting. Number three, we have Boy in the World. Didn't see it. Number four, we have Sean the Sheep movie. Delightful. Number five, we have When Marnie Was There. Haven't seen it. All right. Uh, and before we even go into the short films, I do want to say I tweeted this, but I hate that it's called Sean the Sheep movie because that is not a way you title your movie. Because when yeah. you fr- it, it should be either the Sean the Sheep movie or Sean the Sheep the movie. Because saying Sean the Sheep movie changes it from Sean who is a sheep, it's Sean who is a sheep movie. Or it's like Sean the movie that is also a sheep. It's just, it doesn't make sense. How do you know it's not? How do you know the movie's name isn't just Sean? Like uh, like the birth name of the movie was Sean. Because the it's character a movie about is, a sheep. Sean, is Sean the sheep. Maybe it's not named after the character. It, you don't know that. It is. How do you know I'm not right? It's it's Sean the Sheep the movie. It should be, but it's no. It's just Sean the Sheep movie, and it's so stupid. I don't like it. They Ardman should be murdered. That's that's uh, a bit too far. Uh, just a bit. Uh, I, I was going to make a joke, but actually, that is something that hasn't happened yet. So I'm going to wait until next week. Is that something that hasn't happened yet? Uh, the the shooting of Nick Park at the Academy Awards. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, I have an episode that's coming out right after this one that I've recorded, and I don't want to spoil anything about that episode. But I'm uh, probably going to yes. cut this entire section out. Oh, fair. You should. Uh, but anyway. Uh, I hope to God you don't leave most of my bits in here. I just like. Generally. I'm not edit. I don't edit most of my episodes, you know. So it's like, oh, like no. your your ep- like Thug Ruffalo is going to be a very prominent. Oh well, part Thug Ruffalo it. should. Thug <laughs> Ruffalo is a good bit. That's that's a joke I stand. By. It's not a good bit, but it's, it's not. But it, I stand by it. But you can edit this stuff. Out. Yeah, I maybe I'll keep Thug Ruffalo into this episode too. We'll we'll see. We'll see how the edit goes. I'm going to cut out what's easy to cut out. Yeah, but anyway. Our first nominee and the year's winner is Bear Story, directed by Gabriel Osorio Vargas. This is Vargas's first and only nomination and win, as well as Pato Escala Piera. Uh, Bear Story is also the first Latin American film to win or ever be nominated for an Oscar in this category, as well as the first Chilean film to win an Oscar in any category. Though they're not the first Chileans to win Oscars, that goes to who cinematographer Claudio Miranda when he won for Life of Pi. The two nominees this year both graduated from college in the mid-2000s, with Vargas getting a degree in fine arts from the University of Chile with certificates in graphic design and 3D animation, and Piera getting a degree in audiovisual communications specializing in post-production. I don't have information about how the men met, but I know that they, along with Antonia Herrera and Mari Soto Aguilar, went on to form Punkbot Studios in 2007. The studio's first success was the Chilean children's animated series Flippos, which I think means freak out. Uh, The studio's very next project was Bear Story. But beyond that, Punk Robot Studios has made other short films like I Am Little Red, a PSA warning kids about sex trafficking, as well as more TV series like The Adventures of Muelen and Perlita, and a feature film, uh, Nahuel and the Magic Book. However, the studio's most world-famous work, even more than Bear Story, is In the Stars, the third episode of season two of the anthology series Star Wars Visions, which was written, edited, and directed by Vargas. Lastly, while they're, when they're not making movies, Vargas and Pierre both work at the University of the Americas, with Vargas teaching in, uh, teaching in and leading the 3D department, while Pierre is an executive producer of everything in the digital arts school. The school is actually what gives Punkbot the resources to make their films, at least originally. Nowadays, I think the company has likely built up some resources of its own, though the two men are still working there to this day. But now, let's now take this back to Bear Story. 
Vargas drew inspiration for the story from his grandfather, who was exiled from Chile in 1973, once Augusto Pinochet took power during the infamous coup d'etat that overthrew Salvador Allende. Uh, the Pinochet regime featured endless violence and cruelty towards civilians, including over 3,000 people murdered, more than 40,000 were tortured, and over 200,000 were exiled. It was a dark time for Chile and one that many Chileans are still trying to grapple with to this day. Vargas viewed this film as a kind of therapeutic process for him and his family as he adapted the story of his grandfather into that of a bear being kidnapped and forced into a circus. He even says that when he met his grandfather, who came back from Chile 20 years after his exile, his first thought was that he looked like a bear and how big he was. He says that the hardest part of the film was just making the story accessible for everyone, balancing both the darker themes with the more simple surface story, just keeping the emotions of the film at the forefront in order to make the film relatable. Vargas and Punkbot were able to receive 20 million peso grant or 40,000 US dollars from, from the government of Chile to make the film, which isn't a lot, but it was enough to get the film started. They ran out of money multiple times while making the film. It, extending one and a half years of work over the span of four years. But by the end, they did end up with a completed film, of course. The film's international success, including its Oscar win, became a source of pride and inspiration for Latin American animation as a whole, in conjunction with the Brazilian film Boy in the World being nominated for Best Animated Feature. I believe it's times like this that really show that, that the Oscars do matter, especially to those who do not find themselves in the conversation often. And stories like this that made me want to do this podcast to begin with. Also, the, the fact that the that the Oscar was presented by the Minions. That's also fun. But Bear's story begins with a bear in his home tinkering with a box. He lives alone, though it's clear a family used to live there with him. Once he finishes, he heads out into town and rings a bell. Child Bear runs up to him with a coin, and he starts cranking the box as a story unfolds within it. We see the bear happy with his wife and son, but then the circus comes into town and beats and kidnaps many of the animals from the city and takes them away. The bear is forced to perform the circus for years, but one day is able to escape and he rides back home. He finds the apartment he used to live in and finds his family inside. The diorama then ends, the child bear gives the big bear his coin, and he walks away with his dad. Gordon, what did you think of Bear's story? I thought it was fine. I thought it was, uh, uh, on an animation level, I thought it was well done. I liked the way that uh, it integrates the like the more fluid animation of the actual bears and then the like the the internal I and mean, a majority of the the short is within this like clockwork wind up uh, presentation that I thought was uh, I liked the animation style of that. Uh, I it definitely while watching it, I was kind of a uh, uh, not nonplussed uh about like what was really going on and what it was trying to say and then you know I, I read up after the fact and it 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 reads better once you know the specific story it's telling uh because i, I don't know uh but yeah i i thought it was good i thought it was a a very competently done short uh had a, a few if not issues just like little things of like I I get it, but also this poor kid that paid a coin to watch a, <laughs> a, a wind up thing and was like, "Hey, I was a political prisoner for most of my life, and then um, I I finally found my family again." But also, I probably didn't. They might be dead. I don't know. I mm -hmm. gave myself a happier ending in this little uh, wind up box. Have a good life, kid. Politics are hell, or or whatever. Like that. Mm -hmm. That part was a little like. Okay, well, I'm stepping back and looking at it from a more cynical perspective uh, of of what's literally going on, rather than you know what it's trying to evoke as a short. Uh, but yeah, I thought I thought it was a, a very well done short. Uh, my my main takeaway was that this fucking bear is a really good engineer because Jesus yeah. Christ, how does that all fit in the box? <laughs> There's so many zooms out from from like into wide shots that then zoom like that's a yeah yeah. And it's like the, the things like change perspective has just like the bear is like just not connected to things at points. And it's just like, what? How how does this look actually to the kid? It's and it's like this is why he pays the fucking coin. It's because like it's 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 fucking magic. Yeah. But magic bear. But yeah, in seriousness, it's like I I 
on my first watch of this, I didn't really enjoy it that much. It's, it's like it used to be a film like that, like I just never really knew much about. Like or I watched it and didn't just lift my line, mind immediately. But like watching again, of course, like reading up on it and having to do the research, it was just like it. It is a very emotional film, and it's like I do understand why this thing won, and especially. Especially since I found out that like the Chilean government did help a lot with the Oscar campaign, yeah. uh, which might be the real reason why it won. But also, it's just like it's a good film. I I definitely understand this winning thing, and it's just like, and we'll get to like the other nominees, and we can get into like why those ones also lost, why all of those lost, because like this is this is a film with or this is a year with a lot of like. Maybe not great, but with at least notable films. Films, it's like films with like either like really famous people behind them or with really big companies behind them, and, and it's just like it's a very dense year. And it's like it's really nice to see like Bear's story win this. It's like the these were the only real outsiders of this lineup, um, and it's just like and to see that they win, it's just like yeah. Good for them. I'm very happy for them. It's just like, would I have preferred something else to win? Not to spoil my ranking, but yes. But it's still not a winner I'm going to be mad at or anything. Yeah. It's, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that I'm happy for them. And it's like, I'm just thinking like, I feel like these people, like, they are the ones who are most affected by a win. It's just like, it's like, yeah, let them have the win. It's fine. That there are much worse winners in this category. Oh yeah. Also known as the 2020 so far. And I and here's another prediction of this year. I bet it's going to be a bad winner again. It's I uh, don't remember. I haven't seen any of the shorts nominated this year in any category. What's what's up? So we've got War is Over, which is uh John which is inspired by the music of John and Yoko. Right. Right. Uh, we have Letter to a Pig, which is about the Holocaust. Uh, we have Pachyderm, which is about sexual abuse of a child. Uh, and then we have two good ones. We have uh, Our Uniform, which is about uh, an Iranian girl's like time in childhood and her relationship to the hijab. Uh, and then uh, my favorite one, which is 95 Senses, which is by Jared Hess of Napoleon Dynamite fame. Uh <laughs> Uh, it's Tim Blake Nelson voicing this old guy who's telling his story. Yeah, I won't even spoil how it ends because I want you to watch it. But that it's, sounds fun. Yeah, it's really good. But yeah, and it's probably going to be the f terrible John Lennon one. Uh, it's like produced by Sean Lennon and Peter Jackson, of course. Of course, they're not nominated for it, but they're like the executive producers. But it's just like, God, it's terrible, and it's probably going to win. And if it's not that, it's going to be the terrible Holocaust one. That's depressing anyway i hope it's something better because anything can happen in this category clearly looking at this yeah. year <laughs> look but, at bear story yeah like if bear story can win anything can win that's true yeah i remember this is like the i mean there's obviously a reason why i was following this race is the reason i'm talking about this race this year uh but i remember following this one at the time and being like well this is this other one is clearly the best one in the category, having not seen any of the others. Uh, <laughs> so it's probably going to win, right? Like other people online are backing that up. Other people are saying that one's probably going to win. Uh, I don't know how much that actually was in the air at the time, if that one was predicted to win uh, or if that was just me being very uh, uh, selective about what predictions I was willing to listen to. But yeah, this one, uh, from what I can tell, was kind of a surprise winner, right? Yeah, like it, like so. The short film categories are also are always just impossible to predict. Like yeah. when people make predictions, they just go with the most famous one. Like Pixar films are always going to be leading the predictions, no matter what. Uh, and it's just like there's no real reliable way to predict anything. Like you can probably like bet on a Netflix film, and it'll likely win. And like nowadays, at least, yes. But even then, it's just like that doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, uh, it's like, like for example, the twenty twenty one, like Robin Robin was the Netflix nominee, and that was expected to win, but then it went to the windshield wiper, or which is just who who the fuck knows what who who which, knew like what the windshield wiper was or any of the people involved with that before that 
Nobody did. Mm-hmm. But which just... one is the windshield wiper? I can't remember if I've seen that or not. Probably not. Um, I I barely remember it either. It's just like a. It's like it just jumps around from all these different people. It's like a it's a series of like like vignettes or whatever, just about all these people in their lives. It's it's hard to really talk about. It, it, it's yeah, it's whatever. I don't really care about it, but. We'll get to that when we get to there. And that is that's not going to be your episode, though. No. Right. But okay, anyway. I, I just looked it up. I have not seen it. Uh, looking at stills of it does not look familiar. Anyway, back to Bear's story. Back to Bear's story. I don't even know where we left off or how we got on that tangent. But I truly don't. Oh, I don't either. Um, but I, yeah, um, I I like it. I like the on on a technical level. Um, his family's like dead, right? Yeah, like I'm. His, his wife and kid are like super dead. I'm just like so. I think I'll just go into like I was emotionally like I think I was like talking about like my relationship with the film. Um, but then anyway, it was like on right. this watch. Uh it's like it did hit me a lot more emotionally, especially in reading on the film. Um, and it's just like and especially that ending I think really got to me because it's like like in in the music box, it's like it it shows him getting back with his family and stuff. But as we saw at the beginning, he's alone and he like goes into his child's room. There's nobody there. And it's just like the fact that he just makes this happy ending for himself in this fiction. It's just like that. That hurts. That really hurts. Yeah. I just. Yeah, it's. This is a good film. I'm, I'm, it I'm glad it won. It it's is. like I, I understand why it won. And and again, I I am and I'm on your side where it's like I don't love this. I don't think it's like it's not my favorite nominee in this lineup. But at the same time, I really enjoy it. I think it is a deserving winner. And people who are really mad about World of Tomorrow not winning should take a chill pill. I won't, but thank you. <laughs> we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Um. Uh, but yeah. Uh. Anything else you like to say about Bear Story? Uh, no, no. All right. Then we'll go, go on to our second nominee, which is Prologue, directed by Richard Williams. And gear, buckle your seatbelts. I have probably the longest paragraph I've ever written about anybody. Uh, this is Williams' second and final nomination in this category, previously winning for A Christmas Carol 43 years prior, and the first and only nomination for Image and Sutton, Williams' longtime wife and producer. If you're a fan of animation, Richard Williams needs no introduction. We last with we last left off with him as his career was finally getting started, as A Christmas Carol was the first film that really gave him a bit of notoriety and got him more opportunities. He would direct the opening credits for two Pink Panther films, those being The Return of the Pink Panther and The Pink Panther Strikes Again, and then would direct his feature film, his first feature film, Raggedy Ann and Andy, a musical adventure. When offered the film, Williams had initially declined and offered up John Hubley's name instead, but once Williams read the script and listened to the music that had been written, he was a lot more interested. The film, however, ended up as a massive flop, but he then made the biggest film of his career, Ziggy's Gift, a TV special based on the comic strip character Ziggy. I kid, of course, although Ziggy's Gift did earn Williams an Emmy, but it was after Ziggy's Gift that Williams was approached to be the animation director on Who Framed Roger Rabbit his actual biggest film of his career. Williams was extremely hesitant as he hates mixing together live action and animation and also just hates Disney with a passion. But when Disney and Spielberg offered to both move the, move the production to London and finance and distribute the thief in the club, the cobbler Williams long time. I'm like passion project. Williams was on board. The production proved an immense challenge for all involved, but it worked. Williams would win two Oscars for the film, one for his work on the visual effects and an honorary Oscar for his work on the animation. So finally, Richard Williams had his success, and now Disney and Spielberg will help him with The Thief and the Cobbler, his intensely ambitious animated feature that he's been trying to get made for 30 years, right? Well, no. Disney instead started focusing on their own animated features rather than help Richard Williams with his And Spielberg made his own animation studio also in London to compete with Richard Williams. But let's go back a bit instead and tell this whole story. So in the 1960s, early in Williams' career, he wanted to make a film about Mullah Nasruddin, a character from the Muslim folklore, with the film based specifically on translations and essays about the old stories by Idris Shah. 
In the 60s and 70s, production moved along slowly for the film, but also but a lot had gotten done. A reported three hours of animation had been created, but at the same time, the film had no plot. And after a spat over finances, Richard Williams and the Shaw family parted ways, with Williams no longer having the rights to the Nusruddin stories. So, what next? Well, they had to rework a film where they lost all rights to use the main character. Richard Williams picked out some of his favorite characters from the film he had, mainly the thief and the slimy vizier, and some writers and got some writers to give several script treatments while also trying to get more funding to make the film again. Little by little, Williams acquired more and more funding for the film and was able to get more and more animation done on it. Though the film also kept getting reworked and scenes were getting cut and re-added, Richard Williams had also insisted that they get a major Hollywood studio to back the film rather than try and get it made in some minor animation studio in Europe. In 1989, post-Roger Rabbit, Williams was able to finally get a big studio, Warner Brothers, to fund the completion of the film as well as $25 million advertising budget. However, they gave Richard Williams a deadline in 1991 to finish the film. I will mention at this point that I think at no point in Williams' career has he ever not gone over a deadline or, or not gone over, gone over a budget or passed a deadline. So yeah. despite absolutely cruel treatment of animators and overwhelming perfectionism, Williams does, did not meet the 1991 deadline. Not only did he not meet the deadline, but he had been lying to production to producers for months, showing them footage he had animated in the 70s and 80s as if it were brand new. And the animation he was still making had no place in the actual final film with still no real plot to the film. Every backer left the project and the film was repossessed by the completion bond company who handed the film off to producer Fred Calvert to finish the film and finish it cheaply. The film got turned into a Disney-esque animated musical, right, as the Disney movie Aladdin was released in theaters, which was allegedly inspired by the Thief of the Cobbler itself. It took 18 months, but Calvert released the film in 1993 as The Princess and the Cobbler. It was acquired for distribution in America by Miramax, with Harvey Weinstein making even more changes to the film and releasing it in 1995 as Arabian Night to no fanfare, making only 300000 at the box office. There were later attempts to try and salvage the film Richard Williams wanted to make, with him showing the work print at many festivals, but the closest attempt there has been to the finished film is the fan restoration called The Recobbled Cut. But I digress. After the immense failure of his decades in the making passion project, what does William do next? Well, of course, he teaches. He started a series of animation masterclasses and would travel around the world to share his knowledge. These classes would eventually turn into the book, The Animator Survival Kit, released in 2002, with a special edition in 2009. He was also given residence at Ardman Animation, not to work on any specific project, just to be there. But while there, he did work. He, made, he first made a short film called Circus Drawings, based on his own drawings of circus performers from the 1950s. And... And then made the film that we brought up so long ago, Prologue. The title of Prologue comes from the fact that it was literally meant to be a prologue for a feature film of his, an adaptation of Lysistrata by Aristophanes, which he jokingly gave the working title, Will I Live to Finish It? The tragedy is, of course, he did not live to finish it, but we at least still have this short film. Williams first discovered the play as a teenager, and it stuck with him throughout his life. As a young animator, he wondered if he would ever be good enough, uh, be, ever be a good enough animator to make Lysistrata, and he says the first time he felt confident enough in himself was after he finished Roger Rabbit. The production, however, wasn't too focused on finishing the feature film, as it was giving Richard Williams the opportunity once again to just make something wholly for himself and give himself total creative control of its outcome. And the film was made with the absolute most bare bones of techniques, pencil and paper. While there is minor technology used for collating the images and removing dust and fingerprints from the drawings, the rest is just back to basics. Pro Prologue features four Greek soldiers, two on each side trying to kill each other. All four die in the process, and the little girl watched the whole thing. So, I, I, I shouldn't still talk after reading all of that, but my thoughts on the film... Are, let's start with my thoughts on Richard Williams. I get annoyed by him a lot. I, I think there might have been a slight tone thing in that paragraph, but uh, I I'm not the I think people go way too hard for Richard Williams because I just think 
he tries his best to be so fucking smooth with his animation. He animates on the ones. And I just think that doesn't always work, especially with the projects he's trying to do. And it's like just an example outside of this short film is that in I watched a bit of Ziggy's Gift, the TV special he made in the 1980s. And even that film is like animated on the ones and everything just comes across so smooth. And I'm just like, Richard, why are you doing this to yourself? Not everything needs to be this fucking smooth. Why are you just wasting so much extra time just to get this other, this extra animation that doesn't even add anything? And if anything, just detracts from the experience of watching it because it's just too smooth. And then for prologue, this doesn't even feel like it's about the film, the thing it's trying to be about. It's not about this fight, right? Because it just feels like it's more just about how fancy his animation is. It's like how how much this camera is moving everywhere and all around the action, going in and out of all the faces and characters and everything. And, and it's just it's just so distracting that you can barely even watch the action and even when you are paying attention to the action it's just not exciting because again it's all too smooth there isn't any excitement there isn't any like real like movement to it because it's just so smooth it just doesn't work to for at least for me maybe other people think this is like a great short film maybe and i guess other people do think that he's like one of the greatest animators of all time but i just don't agree with that sentiment because i and i do see like a lot of like quotes from like actual animators who also don't like Richard Williams, but also it's like a lot of people really love him because he is like a legend in the animation industry. Maybe I'm just a hater. I don't know. But prologue as a short film, just in this context is fine. Like, and it, it's not really deep or anything. It's just four guys killing each other. And then a girl happens to see it all. And it's like, wow, violence sucks. But then again, it's, not even meant to be a short film, really. It was meant to be a prologue to a feature film. But since we don't have that feature film, we just have this. It's just a short film. And the short film is mediocre, despite the really impressive, really impressive, yet kind of vapid animation style. Gordon, please talk. I liked it. <laughs> I don't know. It was, I, I thought it was fine. Um, uh, it was... I probably I, I agree more with what you're saying about how it was more technically impressive than like a a, a short that I I don't know uh, I, I I thought it was technically impressive like even aside from the like animating on the ones and and all that like he's still getting hand drawn very realistic faces with camera movement like that like the the ability to keep all of that and maybe that is because he is animating on the ones and can keep it all so smooth uh from frame to frame uh but i i, I was impressed with that uh it's real short right and like how 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 long is this one like it's six like six minutes. minutes yeah i mean six minutes where not a lot happens other than a whole bunch of violence for a little bit uh I I don't have that much to say about it. Here's a question that I wrote down in my notes or or uh partially as a joke, but then I am genuinely curious. Is this the first uh short that you've come across that has a penis in it? Oh, far from it. Okay. There's a fair. lot. Like there's So the first one that had at least like any nudity was in like the 60s because there's it's pianissimo that has like a bust of like a naked woman in it. Yeah. And then there's multiple films like by like Bob Godfrey. There's a dream doll that do have like naked people in it. And it's just like, there's, there's definitely multiple films with nudity in them. Yeah. And now that I ask that out loud, I think we maybe even covered one with um the, the Kama Sutra thing. Yeah. That, that, that was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Was, we we you were literally on that episode. I look. I I watched these ones real early this morning. Uh, uh, so I was pretty tired when I wrote these questions, and I didn't think about it till just now. Um, but yeah, no, we've 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 done one of those. Never mind. Question re retracted. 
Yeah, not even uh, the first British film that has features nudity that was also nominated in this category. Also, uh, to to fully steal the joke that you sent me when watching these, not the first one you've talked about where someone's anus is bleeding. That is correct. <laughs> that was a, I did like that ending. Where it's like I, it's probably not meant to be funny, but it is funny when it's like you just think the guy's dead, and then all of a sudden sticks Stabs a sword up his ass. Right up the ass, and then that girl saw it, and she's scared. She just said, I do think anus is bleeding." Yeah, I do think the last. Excuse me. I think I do think the last shot is pretty, uh, uh, not great. Where it's the woman, like the old woman's face, and then she just like strikes a pose and looks at the camera of like war. War, war never changes. I'm old. It, it it's like that one commercial from the 70s where it's like the native american it's like after somebody litters he's just a tear yeah. rolls down his face it's just uh yeah i have nothing else more to say about Pro yeah Lager. this is not a very notable film. like people go hard on it because it's like R- richard williams is the animator that people who don't know animation think is like the peak of animation where it's just like super realistic super smooth who there's just like you gotta animate every single frame and it's like you should be animating 60 frames per second also oh blah blah, blah. and if you can't do it use ai to help you it's Jeez, just like yeah i i don't remember you going this hard on richard williams when we did that christmas carol one. Oh, were you on the christmas carol episode yeah i didn't even know i i, I guess i did know but i completely forgot yeah i was gonna say what do you mean you didn't know like we like you were there. I, I forgot that you were the one I, I had on the... Yeah. Like, I don't... Because I don't even... Like, I didn't give you this episode because you were on the Christmas Carol episode. But, yeah. No, hey. It just sort of worked out that way. But yeah. And it's like... It's because I do like a, his A Christmas Carol. That's probably my favorite film of his. Although I need to rewatch Robert the Rabbit. It, but it's just like... It's, it's mainly just like reading up on him like for the plot for this episode like especially reading into the production of thief of the cobbler and it's just like every step of the way it's like people view that as like this great tragedy of animation it's just like he should have been allowed to make the film that he wanted to make it was going to be a masterpiece but now it's terrible and we can we'll never get it but it's like i've watched three cobble cut and it's like even like so there are parts of it that are like missing there's like of course like the the pencil tests and stuff that are in there in place of real animation and and it's like there's parts without music but even if i believe that even if he got to make exactly the film he wanted it would have been made it would not have been great like of course like like it's got the super smooth animation and there are a few great scenes in it like there's the one famous chase scene where it's like it goes into like the checkerboard or chessboard like pattern area it's like that's a really fun sequence but at the same time it's just a very generic plot it's like it it, like like we've done like this these orient orientalist arabian plots or whatever time and time again in hollywood and it does nothing new with that kind of shit and it's like the the main the main love interest is literally named Princess Yum Yum. That is a Richard Williams invention. It's not like something that Harvey Weinstein put him. It's just like, God, he he's so fucking British. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's just like, yeah, and it and like I was saying, it's just like when reading in the into the history of film, it's just like every step of the way. It's more about Richard Williams' work ethic that makes him lose out on like all the funding. And it's like he is the reason why it took 30 years to get made. It's not because of like nobody would give him a chance. It's because he was wasting producer money to make like three hours of animation that won't go into the movie. Yeah, I, I've I've seen bits and pieces. I don't know nearly as much a uh, uh, uh in depth about it but sounds uh i i i trust you on Mm -hmm. on all that yeah i was going to watch the uh there is a documentary about the production of thief and cobbler i forget what it's called but i was going to try and watch that before recording this like just in case there was like maybe another part of the story i'm missing but i didn't get around to doing it so it 
if, if I watch it and just like suddenly regret everything I said, I'll I'll make sure I add a note of it. But otherwise, <laughs> I'll, I'll make you re-record the episode, Gordon. Oh no! We'll we'll have to do all three of them again. All three <laughs> yes! episodes. All start three. start from scratch. Yeah, if, if you're listening to this episode, uh, you didn't listen to the other episodes. This is the third part of a three episode recording session that Gordon and I have been doing today. Those so you can go back and listen to the 2010 episode of this podcast and the Escape Me Never of Gordon's Lone Acting Nominee podcast. Go do it. After we we'll still wait. have three more shorts to talk about on this we'll, one. We'll Jesus. wait here. Don't worry. But okay, we, you can just pause us. So we'll move on. But anything yeah. else you'd like to say about Prologue? No. All right. Then we'll go on to our third nominee, which is Sanjay's Super Team, directed by Sanjay Patel. This is the first and only Oscar nomination for for Patel, as well as producer Nicole Paradise Grindle, but the 12 nomination for Pixar, last nominated for La Luna in 2011. Patel and Grindle both got their start in the 90s television animation, with Patel working on The Simpsons as a layout artist, while Grindle worked on shows like Aeon Flux and Liquid Television. Patel and Grindle both began their Pixar careers on A Bug's Life, with Patel doing character design and animation, while Grindle was an effects manager. The two of them then simply just kept working at Pixar, with Patel working in various capacities as character designer, animator, and story artist, while Grindle climbed the ladder at Pixar from effects manager roles into producing. The two people, of course, converged on this short film, while Grindle is still at Pixar to this day, with most of her recent credits and just being executive producer or special thanks. Patel left quickly after the Oscar nomination, focusing his efforts more on films celebrate or er, centering his Hindu faith, illustrating children's books about various Hindu deities, with his most popular books being Ganesha's Sweet Tooth and Ramayana Divine Loophole. And currently, Patel is the creator of Ghee Happy, a YouTube web series imagining the Hindu deities as children discovering their powers in a daycare. Going back in a break from tradition, rather than Patel having to ask John Lasseter to make his short, Lasseter went to Patel to encourage him to make a short film. Patel was resistant, but it was his picture books that inspired Lasseter to seek out Patel. Patel was scared to be in the director's chair as he's a pretty introverted person who prefers to work alone, especially work that is so very personal to him. Uh, he asked his father for guidance, who encouraged him to take on the film, saying it would be bad karma to reject it. Patel also enjoyed the opportunity to provide representation of an Indian family and Hindu culture. This film, along with Patel's other works, are rooted in Patel wanting to be more invested in his faith. As a child, he never really bothered to ask his father about the religious traditions. He was just bored and wanted them to be over with. But as an adult, he wanted to really research what it all means. He called his books book reports, and their purpose originally was just for his nieces and nephews to learn more as well. That was the original purpose of the short as well, but John Lasseter had taken interest in Patel's dynamic with his father and wanted that to be the forefront of the story, whereas Patel had originally seen it as just kind of mundane. A lot of the style of the film was an attempt to make the fight scenes look and feel unlike anything Pixar had ever done before. The fighting itself takes more inspiration from Hindu dance than any kind of combat, and the lighting itself is deliberately unreal to depict the world of the deities. The film was released alongside The Good Dinosaur, and the reactions were that it was better than The Good Dinosaur. One of its fans is Patel's father, who said it was very good. The film starts with Lil Sanjay watching his favorite cartoon, Super Team, holding his action figure of the main hero. However, his dad forces him to stop and beckons him over to perform the daily puja, a Hindu ritual to honor the, dailies, the deities. For Sanjay's father, his chosen deities are Vishnu, Durga, and Hanuman. And as the ceremony is performed, Sanjay starts to daydream and imagines himself in a large temple. And as the candle goes out, a smoke monster rises and starts destroying statues of the deities and taking their powers. Sanjay uses his action figure to relight the candle, which brings the deities back, who use their powers to try and stop the monster. But it's not enough. It's up to Sanjay to stop it. He uses his action figure to help destroy the monster, but destroys it in the process. However, they de the deities do replace it for him. And son suddenly, Sanjay is back in reality. His father is upset, thinking Sanjay will never accept the religion, but Sanjay then draws the deities in his journal as they are Sanjay's super team. Gordon, what did you think of the film? 
I thought it was sweet. I I thought it was uh uh you know, it, it's it's a pretty simple sort of standard uh well, it's not that standard, but it's it's a Pixar short and I I knew you know going into it that it's a Pixar short and what to expect from that. And it does a good job. It's a, a fairly straightforward story and I think it it did a good job of making that story compelling, making it fun. Uh, the animation, especially of the deities in that fight scene, uh, that part was the, the more interesting part to me, just like visually, but I, I thought it was good is sort of generally where I come down on it. It's not so it didn't wow me like in, in a way that I was unex not expecting, you know, because it's <laughs> Pixar and it, it it's it's on par with the the sort of average Pixar short. Uh, and I didn't see the good dinosaur, so I can't compare it to that. A uh, good dinosaur is very mid. Uh, that is but, everything I've heard about it. Yeah, it's just like super boring. But anyway, Sanjay Super Team, it is just a very nice short film. Like it tells a uh, the very simple story. Uh, boy and father don't get along. They the boys kind of bored by religion, and then daydreams, and it's like there's the fight scene that I described, and it's all. It's all very simple. It's all very like standard in terms of plotting, but of course it's still nice to see like Hindu representation. Yeah. And it's just like and the fight scene the fight scene is really interesting because it's like it is both like actually genuinely exciting, but also like super calming. Yeah. Because like I I forget if I wrote this in the paragraph or if I deleted that line, but um us uh, Sanjay Patel, he specifically asked the composer to like not include any of the stereotypical like things you would expect from like Indian whenever people like portray India or Indians on film. Um, they use like sitars and things like that. And Sanjay did not want that. And set so instead, like all the music in that sequence is like the bell and like the father's chanting. And like because like it's all about that ritual, that's what's in Sanjay's head. And, and so, but that provides this like really calming mood to the whole fight scene. And it's like, as well as like the action of the scene all being just like these like dance moves and whatever, or it's just like, it all portrays like, it creates this really unique mood for this fight scene that I really, really like. Like, and it's just like, it's like, like I said, it's both calming and exciting at the same time. It's a nice, nice combination of moods. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a, uh, it's sweet. It it is a, uh, I don't know. I, I I don't really have that much more to say about it because, it's uh, I don't know. It's good. It's a good one. But I will say, I don't think Super Team is that good of a TV show. I think Sanjay should grow up. Yeah, just watch something better. Yeah, watch uh uh Breaking Bad. Yeah. I was trying to think of like what's a mature show, and the only thing my br that was coming to mind was Roots for some reason. <laughs> Just trying to think of like what would be the polar opposite, but I don't think that's a joke that I can make or should make. So, if you want to cut that part out, feel free to. No, you're fine. It's staying in. Okay. It's just well, like the whole point is like you didn't want to say that you were trying to think of something else, but all you can think of was roots. I I guess I don't know. I don't know. So, Sanjay's Breaking Bad, though. It's yes. Just like Sanjay's uh, Sopranos. Yeah. What's the so, Sanjay's Carnival? Why am I? Why are these the shows I'm pulling? <laughs> What, what, I don't know. What's that one uh, TV movie where it's like the baseball player dies? It's like Brian's oh, song. Sanjay's Brian's Brian song. Sanjay's, Sanjay's Brian's song. <laughs> uh, Sanjay's Ron Howard's Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. No! Oh, God. Sanjay's Precious based on the novel Push by Sapphire. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, um, this is yeah. a bad. This is not a good bit. We've had better no. bits in the past. Yeah, we've had better bits today. This is no thug, Mar thug Ruffalo. Thug Markle. <laughs> God, we we are too tired for this. Very. We've been recording at this point for all for like three and a half hours. 
Mm -hmm. And we still have two shorts to go. Yeah. But anyway, Sanjay Super Team, very good Pixar short. And like, even though it's like, it's still like a standard family dynamic, it's Pixar knows what they're doing at this point. It's like, it's yeah. hard for them to make a bad short. It's like, I can't even like outside of like the ones that are like based around like a specific feature film. Um, like those ones are kind of bad sometimes, but in terms of these ones where like, it's more of the point just to get the animators just like stretch their limbs a little bit. It's rare for them to ever be all that bad. Although I can think of a few of the spark shorts are pretty bad, but outside of those, most of these ones are pretty good. That's fair. I will take your word for it. You should watch the spark shorts. It's like, they, I they're... don't know what those are. Which so ones are those? it's, it's basically just like, so instead of doing feature uh, short films before their feature films, they start doing short films on Disney plus us uh, so, or ah, they used to be on YouTube. Yeah. Now they're on Disney plus and they're called the spark shorts. And I'll have to check them out. Yeah. And so you can watch them all on Disney plus. And there's also uh so that's, that's for Pixar and, uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios has their own thing called Short Circuit, and those are also very good, if not better than the Spark Shorts. Uh, yeah, watch those. Will um, do. That's even to those of you listening right now. I want you all to go on Disney Plus if you have it, and if you don't, like pirate them. Maybe I'm not sure. If, I don't think that you would be able to pirate them. I don't think anybody cares enough to like make them publicly available. <laughs> But or that Disney wouldn't be cracking down on that. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, especially I think it's it's either called going home or coming home. But that's one of the short the short circuit ones. It's also very good. And also watch Burrow because but that's also like an Oscar nominee. We'll talk about yeah. that at a different episode. We will. Actually, yeah, we will. That's gonna yeah. be your next episode. Yeah. So stick around, everybody. But anyway, we'll move on to our fourth nominee, which is We Can't Live Without Cosmos, directed by Constantin Bronzet. This is Bronzet's second nomination, previously nominated for Lavatory Love Story in 2008. And this is where I would go into things Bronzet has done since his last nomination, but this was his very next film. In his words, I'm a very slow-thinking, stupid guy. <laughs> but really, Bronzet's films are largely made just by himself, and for one person to make an animated film takes a lot of work. Though he didn't do it completely alone, mainly he got a uh, comic book artist Roman Sokolov to help him des design the film, as it was more complicated film than he, and he was a little dissatisfied with the look of Lavatory Love Story. And Bronzet also doesn't like the word inspiration. He never feels inspired, but rather he makes a film when he gets an idea and he physically cannot stop himself from making that film. He doesn't choose what he makes. The film and characters choose him fully formed. And and also, Bronze was... I'm just kind of listing random things I saw. This isn't a really good paragraph. But Bronze okay. was surprised by his second nomination. He had developed an idea that filmmakers, especially in animation, only ever get one nomination by sheer luck and then will disappear into the void from whence they came. When he got the second nomination, in his words, I realized to myself how not accidentally my success is, how natural it is. As athletes jokingly say, stability is an indicator of class. Also, there's an interview of him right after he came back from the Oscars, and I love how he compares the 2008 ceremony hosted by Hugh Jackman and the 2015 ceremony hosted by Chris Rock. Uh, compared to the old one, this one, frankly, was a damp pastiche in all respects. Back then, Hugh Jackman hosted the evening. He's a singer, dancer, and showman, and he knew how to do that, how to be a host. This year, the Academy invited Chris Rock, a comedian, so it was definitely a failure in terms of casting. He had nothing to offer the public besides mere declamation. Not to mention the amazing number of stars per square meter that could be found both in the hall and in the foyer of the Kodak Cinema back in 2009. This year, you had to literally keep your eyes peeled at all times to make sure that you were at the Oscars in the famous Kodak and not among some shady riffraff at a concert in the Kremlin Pal Palace of Congresses. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he didn't have fun this time. Poor Constantine. Uh, and in the same interviews... Uh, he bemoans how Russia couldn't give him a proper awards campaign. Meanwhile, Bear Story was able to get plenty of FYC ads out there. And as for what came after, 
he made a somewhat spiritual successor to the film called He Can't Live Without Cosmos. However, Bronza denies that that one should be connected to the other. Uh, they're just two films about cosmonauts, and their themes are not related beyond that. That is his most recent film, and if he's going to make another film, that's not up for him to decide, of course. Uh, he says even that he hopes he won't make another because he thinks it might kill him. So <laughs> I'm not sure if I should wish to, to get another great film from him, but I would like one, but I also don't want him to die. We can't. I live would hope not. <laughs> We Can't Live Without Cosmos is about two cosmonauts who are best friends and both train to go to space. And that's I all I will say about the plot, because I want all of you listening right now to go watch it before I like spoil anything about it, because it is literally I, I don't care about my ranking anymore, but it, this is literally like one of my favorite films of all time not just animated not just nominees in this category not just short films but favorite films of all time it's such a beautiful story about just like friendship but also they're kind of gay i wish they kissed but yeah it's just these two great friends and it's like they're training to be astronauts together they do everything together they jump on their beds like they're flying and it's just like it's all just so cute and then Things happen. I, I I'll keep it vague for now, just so I can give people time to go back. But we'll eventually get into spoiler territory. But it's sad, and I don't. It's like, and it's like, but it's so great. Out. It's so great. What What do you think, Gordon? I liked it. I I really liked it. I thought it was very sweet. It should have been gayer, but it, uh, that, that's unfortunately fair. not everything can be gay. Yeah, I know. But it really felt like this one was pointing towards that and then didn't and that's fine it doesn't have to but uh yeah i i really liked it i thought it was sweet i liked the animation style i liked the way they looked uh i liked the way the uh, it was it was a it was just a compelling little uh, little story mm -hmm. and there's all these beautiful moments in it to, to me it's just like especially in the later half of the movie but it's like something i'll say without like talking about the ending in details like there's this one point where there's a hole in like the ceiling thing. And it's like you, when the characters find out we're told by it, by like just snow, just falling through it. And it's a very beautiful scene, just like the be very beautiful image. And it's just, God, it's, so, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a question, Gordon. Yes. And if you were to describe like what this film is about in terms of themes, like what would you say it's about? Oh man, um, I mean, just like friendship is a pretty basic answer, but I I'm very glad you said that because I have this quote from Constantin Bronzet: "Uh, the film is not about friendship, <laughs> as oh. many viewers think. <laughs> that well, is, it's <laughs> death of the artist. Uh, that is, it seems or as author, such only at first very superficial glance, but if you work hard and look a little deeper." You can understand that such friendship between people does not exist in life. This is my invention, a fairy tale. So in this fiction, my feeling of existential longing for such a relationship was manifested. I would really like that in real life, there would be at least a small part of such mutual understanding between people. But in fact, it is not. So we are all very lonely. That is what the film is about. It's about loneliness. I was not worried about the cosmonauts but the feeling of loneliness. That makes sense. I, I, that, that's definitely a more grounded thesis than mine. Like, well, the movie's about friendship because it's about friends. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah, I, I, I did not feel confident. Uh, play back the tape. You can hear me be very not confident <laughs> in that answer. So uh, ultimately what I'm saying is I am proven correct by being not confident about my answer. <laughs> uh no um yeah no that that definitely tracks it, it's a uh, it uh yeah 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 you know yeah yeah it's a great film anyway now we can get into the sad part so i'll, I'll just finish the plot description so it's like they both get accepted into the astronaut program um, and then one of them is the reserve astronaut the other one is going up and then he goes up, everything's fine for a little bit, but then suddenly the feed cuts out, and then they, they have two cameras. With one, the feed cuts out, and the other one, you see the book that they had that he gave to him as a 
child and it's just like but it that has a hole taken out of it so you know something went wrong and the camera cuts out and then it's just like the other one just shuts down and it's so sad it is terrible and it's just like the one shot of him where it's like they took the x-ray and you could see him like curled up in like a fetal position inside the spacesuit is just god it kills me and then the ending where it's just like They open up the spacesuit and it's just like he's not inside it anymore. And there's the hole in the ceiling. It's like a reference to earlier when he broke you and they were jumping up in the bed together. And then it's just like and he floats up into space and then the hand grabs out and grabs him. And it's all, it's so beautiful. I, I really It is. love this movie, guys. Yeah. I do like in the bit where they're cutting open the spacesuit, uh, they're just fully ready to behead this guy with, Yeah. with how, because like they don't know he's not in there at first, and they just cut straight through the neck of that spacesuit to get the helmet off. They are They are ready to just murder this man. <laughs> but it's just like at that point he's just been so catatonic I wonder if they just think he might be dead Yeah. Uh you know it's 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 a very good short. I I I love this movie and if anything it was, should have beaten Bear Story it's this one <laughs> because Richard Williams already has an Oscar Don Hertzfeld is already one of the most influential people in modern animation Pixar doesn't need shit. Constantine Bronzet just has one not other nomination. He hasn't won yet, and this is one of the best short films ever made. This should have won, but it didn't. And so, ergo, I I actually probably would have been happy, if, or would have at least been fine with any of these winning, except probably Prologue. But, yeah. 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 Anything else you'd like to say about this? Anything you want to say to Constantin Bronzit? Uh uh I hope uh per your wishes that you don't make another short unless you really want to. <laughs> and if you do, I hope you don't die. Yeah. Anyway, you should watch uh He Can't Live Without Cosmos. That one's also I really should. good. I should. I I might after this. All right. So now here's the one that everyone's been waiting for, our fifth and final nominee, which is World of Tomorrow. Yeah, Directed we can by... just skip it. We can just we can just move to the end. Yeah, who who cares? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, directed by Don Hertzfeld. This is the second nomination for Hertzfeld, last being nominated for Rejected in 2000. So where does a man go after redefining internet humor forever? Well, you go a bit more existential. Each Hertzfeld... Hertzfeld film just gets a bit more ambitious than the last, and his very next film was called The Meaning of Life, a series of vignettes set through time across history and of life in the universe. Uh, and next, we have a trilogy of short films that were originally released, released individually, but later combined into the feature film It's Such a Beautiful Day, released in full in 2012, and it is regarded as one of the best animated films of the 21st century, if not of all time. And finally, we get to World of Tomorrow. It is now a trilogy of short films centered around a, real, a little girl named Emily, adult clones of her from the future, and in the third episode, David, Emily's future husband, who also has clones. While all the entries were widely hailed upon their release, the first entry, the one that's nominated today, is the one most commonly considered the best. This film, along with his Simpsons couch gag, were Hertzfeld's first foray into digital animation, and part of that began from Hertzfeld wanting to quit animation after It's Such a Beautiful Day. The process to make a film was just so tiring, but digital animation is just so much quicker, plus you don't have to pay for paper and pencils and don't have a giant camera to worry about. While the process is still slow and somewhat draining, digital animation reinvigorated him. And also, side note, the computer he uses for animating is deliberately not connected to the internet, which keeps him on track, but also means his versions of Photoshop and Final Cut Pro are from 2008. Oh boy. The inspiration for the film came from two ideas he had. First, he imagined a person growing old inside a museum display. The second idea, a person putting the, their loved one's face onto a robot after they've passed. It takes some roots in Hertzfeld's graphic novel, The End of the World, Well, uh, but the meat of the film largely originates in the voice of Winona May, Don Hertzfeld's four-year-old niece. There was a session where Hertzfeld recorded her voice, and from that, 
all the lines of Emily Prime and World Tomorrow are formed. Everything else is just from the mind of Don Hertzfeld and the voice of Emily Pott. Uh, the film is a, or I think it's Julia Pot actually. I think I just yeah. put in Emily because I've just been writing Emily so much. Uh, the film is about Emily, a small child, receiving a message from a clone of herself hundreds of years in the future. The clone tells her about life in the future with all its wondrous technologies, dystopian attitudes, and crippling loneliness. This has been the only episode of the podcast where multiple people have asked me if they could guest on it specifically to talk about this film. And I had to tell them no because you, Gordon, called it way back when we were recording the, the, the 1930s episode. What did you think of World of Tomorrow? It had been a while since I'd watched this one. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen this one multiple times uh, around when it came out. I have not gone back to the sequels since they came out, partially because... I just don't know if I can handle them because, I mean, they're all great. I, I love all these movies. I love Don Hertzfeld. It's Such a Beautiful Day is one of my absolute favorite movies, period. That's a top 10 movie for me. And if I'm, I mean, the World of Tomorrow movies would probably be not far behind if I were putting shorts on my, like, favorites list. And, I mean, they're all so good. This movie, I could probably not quote it front to back, but, like, I wrote down so many things from this movie on, on my notes that are just like favorite moments and favorite lines and favorite bits of like, once you know the like production behind this, there's so many moments of this that just like watching it with that perspective of, oh, this is just a thing his niece said and here's how he retrofitted that and here's all of these thoughts and plot points and things that spiral out just from that. And so, like, even on a meta level, it's a, it's a really interesting commentary on just the artistic process that I really love. The animation is beautiful. It's so simplistic, but all the colors, all the shapes, all of, like, everything about it is so fascinating and wonderful. And it's a movie that no matter how many times I've seen it, no matter how many times I know exactly how it ends, that little fake out ending gets me emotional every single time. Uh it's it's just I really love this. I really love, especially. I guess late period Hertzfeld is what you would call, the uh, it's such a beautiful day onward. But th I mean, there's a, I, I mean, I, yeah. what I would do is I would separate like I I'd say he has four eras. He has his early short films, the student then, films, yeah, like yeah, a, his student uh, films. Then we have rejected and that era. And then we get the It's Such a Beautiful Day trilogy. And yeah. then we get World of Tomorrow. And oh, he's got a couple things he's working on now. He's got yeah. uh, one that's called Me. And then mm -hmm. there's one that apparently is being produced by Ari Aster. Yeah. That I don't know anything else about. I don't know if Antarctica is still in production or not. I don't know if that has been abandoned or what the status on that is. But always uh tentatively looking forward to whatever and whenever the next one from him is but no i i, I love love world of tomorrow mm -hmm. yeah i i have all so i think i've seen like this one like two other times maybe and i've seen the second and third one once each it's and it's like like i of course really love it it's such a just a fantastic short film don hurts felt is just great at everything. I feel like, like even though I do love everything I've seen from him, I'm still just like not as big as a fan of him as everybody else seems to be. That's but, fair. But I still just really love his stuff. I think he's really great. I think he's really funny. He's and he's good at like getting that emotional core while still being very absurdist and hilarious and weird. Weird. It's just like it's it's a really difficult thing to balance, but he does it just perfectly every single time. Right, and it's like World of Tomorrow is just the best example of that. It really is. There's there's so many just like like the the go the through humor your list. The, go, yeah, go through your list. Okay, I'm just gonna go. Yeah, all these notes. Uh, the animation is great. How can you watch this and not give it a win? Fair. Um, uh, a lot of these are just like Emily Prime lines that are just like, it's just like a I had lunch today. Uh, <laughs> cutting in after all that. Uh, do you like my cars where she's playing with a little toy cars that she like left to go get and is running across the panel. Um, 
uh, I drew a triangle. And then uh, the Emily clone saying, I drew a snake boy. <laughs> with a little snake boy. <laughs> yes. And then uh, em- uh, snake boy. <laughs> yesterday, I didn't see any snake boys, but you made one. Uh, uh, I love all the stuff with David in the museum, which I think that is, if not lifted directly from the the comic which what's the name of the comic the end of the world end of the world right um i know there's like it has it like that concept originates from there uh the the poem from the the robots wrote the the moon mover robot oh god oh god uh, oh god no no, no, that's david that that that's Uh, david's consciousness uh move robot move robot always moving but why i didn't write it down specifically why that why robot fear death or something like that yeah um uh, the little monster called simon and uh simon i I love that um oh and and then it's like every so often you can you can just tell uh that there's points where she would say something and hertzfeld is like oh that's absolutely gonna be a emotional moment that's gonna be a, a a bit um uh the uh did you miss me is is so like it is, mm-hmm. is, is a real punch a real gut punch of a line um uh when they're watching the the dead bodies being shot off into space uh and she's like oh those are pretty what are they <laughs> and like they're dead, dead, bodies. dead bodies they're are okay, they okay? <laughs> like they're okay no they're all dead and it just cuts away from that the the memory extraction is yeah, that, like that's me walking with mommy that, that's me and mommy walking. Oh, that's me and, and And then the little rainbow shows up and she's like, you know, thank you for the memory. It was a rainbow. You didn't see it, but I saw it. It's it's so like, man, like I, I could tell you were choking up a little talking about we can't live without Cosmos. I'm choking up a little thinking about that moment. It's just, it's so, so beautiful and so melancholic. And there's, there's just, I mean, he's really good at making those moments work. Uh, and then at the end, uh, when there, there's the bit like earlier on where the the clone Emily is talking about how time time travel. Uh, I love the way she says time travel with with the uh, emphasis there. Um, but uh, some people mess it up and they go back hundreds and hundreds of years than they meant to go. And it almost does that at the end here with Emily yeah. Prime going back to that same snowy backdrop. And then it pops her back to her normal time. And she says, what a happy day it is and, <laughs> and runs away. It's just, it's so sweet. It's so cute and really emotional uh, without feeling like it's, you know, saccharine, like too saccharine or too ironic or too, it's not too anything. It's, it is perfect. Uh, the, the clone should have stayed with the rock. I'm thinking like, I, I yeah. think, I, I think there was real love there. She also fell in love with the robot, mm-hmm. and, and the uh, gas pump. Yes, and and like that also has so many great lines. Uh, just I no longer fall in love with rocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, when she does end up with another David clone, uh, David the the boy without the brain who lived in the museum mm-hmm. for like seventy years, uh, and she says like it, it's something to the effect of even though. We were both clones of clones of clones. I loved him as if we were originals, mm-hmm. which is that's a, that is a really good line. Yeah, and and there's there's like moment like the moment where he just sort of falls over dead, and his his entire clone lineage ends right there. That comes back in one of the sequels. There's like a time travel thing there where I think like either Emily or David is like the one that kills him in that moment, uh, sort of retconned by i think it, it's like david killing himself maybe that that tracks i i because like, i know like i was reading a lot about like in in preparation for this it's like i didn't even end up using a lot of the interviews i was reading because it's like they were all just about like the second and third one uh, but it was just like like there is a lot he was talking about like just making sure all the timelines matched for when he was making part three because that one's just heavily like jumping around all these timelines yeah it's just like if there was a single plot hole, it ruins the whole trilogy. Yeah, but yeah. it's just like he, Don Hartzell made sure everything worked. And it's just like I—I I might just have to bite the bullet and rewatch those. those you're gonna have to rewatch them. You're gonna watch them right after this. I—I I very well might. Not that I like not bite the bullet as in like I've been dreading it, but just like it's gonna be wrecking you. 
yeah emotionally like if this movie that i've seen a bunch of times and remember like everything from already is is still having this effect those two are gonna because I, I remember bits and pieces but i i just have not had the like willpower to go back and, and just really sink in those again so okay here here's what you do you watch uh he can't live without cosmos then you watch richard jewel then yeah. you watch world of tomorrow two and three and then you watch uh the gruffalo's child and then you watch thug gruffalo thug yep and, and then thug markalo thug markalo <laughs> and, and then you watch in and out yes you see, if you people listen to the other episodes first, you would get all these references. They wouldn't, is the thing. They like, would. Because... Well, but they're not references so much as just, like, things we say and just put out there. Like They're references to previous episodes of this podcast. That's fair. And, and this is the perfect episode to make these kind of references because it's the episode that people are going to watch without watching or I mean, listen to without listening to the other episodes. So this is going to encourage them to listen to other episodes, hopefully, unless this episode's terrible. I don't know. Maybe it is. I hope not. I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment there where he said, unless this episode is terrible. And I was like, oh, God, what if it does end up being terrible? As if it's not the one that we're making right now. Like, I, I thought of that as in like, oh, man, whenever you make that episode, I, it had better be good. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, that's I should probably eat something soon what, once what, we're what, done what? with this. I have eaten today, but like I am I am uh, uh, sputtering to a, a near halt. Yeah, but I, I'm I'm just saying it's like I, I can never know like how these things like come across like like as a random listener because i'm just having fun with my friends i yes. i don't really consider the fact that like other people are going to be listening in on our conversations eventually oh as far as i know nobody's listened to my podcast i don't know like i i never really think about the fact that people might so i'm in, with you there in in my mind uh every episode just has one listen and it's christoph every single time honestly every same here <laughs> we love you christoph we love you, Krista. We love you tweeting that you're listening to our episodes. Thank you. Uh, and it's like, but yeah, even though like my like uh, Spotify podcast tells me that it's like each like episodes have like 5, 10, 15, 20 listens. It's just like those aren't real people. Yeah. Nobody but else... also also to the people that in theory are listening to this right now. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Oh, yeah. It's like I, I always do like talk to the general listener out there like that's how i end my my episodes all the time it's like thank you listener for tuning in and it's like i i pretend it's like hundreds of people that it could be potentially but in my mind i'm also just thinking it's just christoph it's so, just christoph and we love that but hey if you are listening to, to this please just let me know i would appreciate like more people telling talking to me about my podcast like what they think of it because i don't get feedback from anybody except christoph and most of his feedback is just telling me that i forgot to upload the episode on time because that's <laughs> happened a few times whoops <laughs> um but yeah anything else you'd like to say about world tomorrow i love it and it's good all right so now that we've gone through and talked about the five nominees, let's rank them all as well as Richard Jewell. Gordon, start us off with your number six. Uh, for all the same reasons I said last time I was on here, my number six is Richard Jewell. It's fine. My number I, six I... <laughs> is Prologue. Uh, because it is just whatever. It's just people fighting and they die. And it's... A, shitty like violence is bad message it gets and it's like <sighs> richard williams i you frustrate me anyway what's your number five uh my number five is uh sanjay super team which i thought was good it was sweet the animation was fine i didn't have many thoughts about it beyond that i i the i wouldn't call it necessarily anything particularly special or it's good i i'm glad it's out there happy for the guy who made it that's excuse me that's as much as of an opinion on it as i have uh my number five is richard jewell like so sam rockwell 
Hall Walter Hauser, Kathy Bates, they're all great in it. And it's like, I, I like a lot of their half of the story. It's kind of funny, kind of dramatic. And it's just like the uh, Centennial Park 30 Minutes thing. That's a great scene. And, but then there's just the weird, like, John Hamm, Olivia Wilde stuff that's just like, what's going on here? Why are we doing this? You know? Oh, and it's like they do the Macarena at one point while they're having a serious conversation. It's like it's funny, but it's not like good funny. It's like bad funny. It's like I shouldn't you shouldn't make me laugh at this scene. But anyway, it's a fine movie. Uh, number yeah. four. Uh, number four would be prologue, which at the very least, like it, I the animation in that, even though some of it is kind of like like you were saying, uh, a, a bit of a show me sort of thing, like he's kind of. If not showing off, like he's, I don't know. I I, I responded more, off. yeah. But it, it's it's some of it is at least worth showing off. Some of it is at least well done, uh, and I I, res I at least responded more to the animation of that than I did to Sanjay's Super Team. Um, but honestly, that one was kind of higher on my list earlier. But as we sort of talked through it, I I I don't really know why it was, and I. I have moved it down so mm -hmm. who knows maybe if i thought on it more it would be lower uh my number four is sanjay's super team as well. well i guess not as well but we you also talked about it at some point yeah uh but yeah sanjay's super team just a decent pixar short it's really good it's got a cute story like i like the fight scene but it's it's, it's good uh number Pretty three good. uh number three would be bear story which is also fine uh it's got some good moments it's uh, as more, I, I respect it after the fact, knowing like the backstory of it, but like watching it without knowing that, I was kind of just sort of. It's fine. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't I I don't know. I feel like I'm I've been saying a lot of it's fine for like a lot of these on both of these episodes we just recorded, but truly, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, my number three is also Bear Story. However, I'm a bit more positive than you. I think. <laughs> it, well, I'm positive like, on it. I, I just, I, I just don't have much I, more. I to said say. more positive. It's like you're still that's, positive, but I'm more positive. That's, that's just fair. I retract my statement. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just like it's got a really great emotional core. It's like I, I like the visuals. Well, I think the not so like the stuff inside the box. I think it looks really great. I think the stuff out of the box. It kind of has that like kind of cheap animation style that kind of irks me a little but you know it's just a short portion of the short the stuff when it's like more stylized with the mechanical parts that's good that looks great uh and like i said the emotional stuff in it just hits especially that ending just think the more you think about it the more it hurts and and then with the like the i'm forgetting the word uh bear <laughs> The cultural context is what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> that was dumb. The cultural context of the film just adds so much more layers to it, but it's also layers I don't think you really need. Like, I was even like reading up on that. It's just like, because a lot of its themes are just universal. Like, I think there's maybe not universal, but there are stories like this all around the world. And it's just like you don't need to be Chilean to resonate with this film, but it's, it's still really great. Yeah. Number two, my number two uh, is We Can't Live Without Cosmos, which I really liked and I really responded to. Uh, it's well animated, it's a well done story. Uh, it, uh, I don't know, I, ha I haven't had as much time to sit with it as uh, my number one, uh, but yeah, I, I really liked it. And who knows what that number one could be? Who knows? <laughs> but uh, it could be anything. It, my it, number it, two, un unrelated. My number two is World of Tomorrow, uh, huh. because well, for obvious reasons, like because my number one is something that's like been like one of my favorite movies ever since I first watched it. But also what that could be. But still, number two, like World of Tomorrow, is still just a really great film. You know, it, there's a reason why it's just. Expl like like why it is one of the most famous short films ever made it, it's like actually i want to just quickly look at like the popularity of like the different films in this category and i realize i don't have the list up right now uh film popularity blah, blah, blah. 
it is currently the fifth most popular film to ever be nominated in this category. And it is big, which yeah. looking at the four that are above it, I even doubt like the letterbox is ranking there, but the four that are above it are the wrong trousers, the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse. If anything happens, I love you. And the number one is bow. Well, it's just because three of those are recent winners. And yeah, so exactly. They're, they're, they're recent popular. Films. Yeah. But and also it is the number one highest rated film on Letterbox of all nominees in this category for obvious reasons. Reasons but, being it's good. Reasons being yeah. that it is widely known and also good. And it's just yes. like I think if We Can't Live Without Cosmos was more widely dist distributed, it would have a higher rating. And it would. I'm going, to, I'm going to just live in my fucking bubble and pretend that like if more people saw We Can't Live Without Cosmos, it would be the highest rated film of all time. It would It's better than the fucking Godfather. <laughs> Hell yeah. I am woozy. I'm delirious. Me too. We're uh, over four hours at this point. Oh boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, before we end our show, are there any? Well, I I still have to say what my number one is. Oh yeah, I, we haven't even said our number. We didn't one. do our number ones. I mean, people know if they've been listening. Yeah, uh, we because we talked about all five yeah. bills, but it's like yeah, you go ahead talk about your number one, which is World of Tomorrow, which I just cannot. I mean, there's a reason, and I thank you so much for letting me hold my claim on this episode. But there's a reason this is one of the ones that like. Way back then, I wanted to stake my claim in early because I, I, I just I love Don Hertzfeld. Like I said, it's such a beautiful day is one of my all time favorite movies, uh, and this movie feels just like a little bit miraculous that it exists and as is as good as it is, and that he's made two more that are just as good, and I'm I'm. Very much looking forward to whatever he makes next, whenever that happens, be it however many years from now that will probably be, or maybe not. Maybe it's coming sooner than we think, yeah, uh, because he's, he's got a couple in the pipeline. Yeah, and he's been, it, he like, he makes them, like, only, like, every few years. Like, I feel like he's probably got something coming out this year. I like, would hope so. Like, mm -hmm. the, because the, there are, at, at, there's at least those two that I know. Yeah. I, I like I double checked his Twitter this morning, one yeah. just to see if if I remembered correctly that it was Ari Aster, um. But then from there, like, I only j had just heard of the Ari Aster thing because he like tweeted in response to something about it. But apparently, there's also one he's working on called Me that I don't know anything about. But that sounds cool, and I I'm excited to see what that is. Yeah, it 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 was fun. Like those two tweets, I also was like a big thing in like my research. Just like. I was just kind of kind of going insane, just like, why have we just heard these two things about these two random films that he's apparently working on? And it's just like, and he's not saying anything else. We don't know, like, how close they are to being finished or anything. And also, like, in my research, he apparently wants to make a lot more World of Tomorrow stuff. I Like, maybe the Ari Aster thing is, like, more World of Tomorrow stuff. I don't know. Could be. Could be. Because he said he wants, like, World of Tomorrow to be, like like 10 films at least he's it's like i'm weird. there for all of them i'm there for all of them i wonder if maybe like he's like he wants to make like a world tomorrow tv show or something that'd be interesting could be i know like the in, in a similar way to it's such a beautiful day the three that are out there now have been like semi repackaged as a feature that maybe uh, like i i think that like shows up when you search world of tomorrow at first it's like world of tomorrow uh, one hour, 23 minutes or mm. whatever the, I don't think it's that long when you pair them together. Cause That's World of tomorrow is only like, like 16, 45 minutes. I mean, let me, cause I don't think the other two are that long either. Like maybe one of them's like 20 minutes. hour, 13 hour, 13 is the, <laughs> the runtime. If you have all three of them, uh, let's see. Uh, episode two, the burden of other people's thoughts. Episode three, oh episode seven, three is half an hour okay Jesus yeah and episode uh, two is twenty three yes okay, okay yeah. so that actually makes sense then yeah okay yeah I I may do those like as soon as we're done with this here but uh oh and what's your number one my number one is of course it's we can't live without the cosmos and you were saying 
uh, that earlier when I was describing it, I was getting choked up. That's partially true, but also it's partially because I feel like I'm kind of losing my voice right now because I've been That's plausible. talking a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Like after that Richard Williams paragraph, it's like my voice was like dying. But I don't blame you. but um, yeah, we can't live with Cosmos. I think I want, first watched that in like maybe 2017, maybe earlier. Or, and it, it's just stuck with me ever since. It's just such a perfect... story of that like friendship and it's like i i think uh bronzet is a bit of a cynic with the idea that like this is a friendship that like can't really exist as or whatever but it, at the same time it's just like it, it doesn't need to exist for you to long for it. it or like it can still exist and still long but whatever both things I no, can be I get true I I get exactly what you're saying, yeah. And it's just like it is both about the friendship and about the loneliness because the loneliness can only happen if you under if you understand what that friendship is or it hurts a lot more having had it and then to lose it. And it's just like it's it's just so painful in just such the best way. And it's just fantastic film. I wish it could have won, but like like Bronze had said, it's he didn't really get the biggest FYC push with it. But it's Yeah. still a great film. And the the nomination itself is just like a way to get more people to watch these films. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that's it. That's our ranking, our top six. And are are you surprised that I didn't rank Richard Jewell last in either of the, either of our episodes? Um kind of I for people that And when I say people that don't get the bit, I don't get the bit. It's just a thing that we decided we were going to do. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know really what I was expecting going into it uh, with with that particular uh, uh, riff. But something I am realizing is I think we view Richard Jewell around the same level of like film quality where it's like, It's fine. it's, it's decent, but it's like, it's not, it's not terrible. It's not that good, but it's like, but it's like in this category, there are some things that are kind of mid. Yeah. Yeah. But before we end our show, are there any final thoughts you'd like to share, Gordon, or anything you'd like to promote? I will uh, promote my podcast, uh, which you have been on several times uh, and Six times. uh, six times. Yeah. As of today or a month ago, depending on where and when you are kind of like world of tomorrow. There's time travel going on. Not Uh, really, but... <laughs> not, not really. But in a, in a way, uh, recorded media is kind of in its own right a form of time travel. Uh, but travel. yeah, I I just I love the way she says it. It's so it's so fun. Um, anyway, you can find my it's, it's the Lone Acting Nominees podcast. You can find it on Twitter at Lone Acting Noms and on Instagram at the Lone Acting Nominees. I release uh every Thursday, which I think is also your uh, releasing schedule. Yeah. So uh uh it's you why can. we can have so many episodes that just Yeah. happen to release on the same date with each other. Yeah. So uh uh after you're listening to this one or whatever other ones uh you happen to be listening to as they come out, uh go give go give uh, yours truly a, a little listen if you'd like. I would uh, appreciate it. Do you have any idea what's coming out on March 28th? Uh March 28th is Love Field. That's that's hilarious. Love Field. Love Field. Go listen to my episode on Michelle Pfeiffer in Love Field. That's another one of those like best actress nominee titles that's just like it's stupid, but in a way that actually no, it's stupid in a way that doesn't stand out. Yeah, It's no, that like one's Escape just, Me Never. yeah, kind of. Anyway, thank you, Gordon, for coming on the show. And thank you, listener, for tuning in. This has been the short podcast about short films. Until next time, goodbye.